recording. Hi folks, we're just giving a few moments here at the start for Zoom to let everybody in to tonight's webinar before we get started with our event. If you are already logged in with us tonight, um, you're welcome to open up your chat window, maybe let us know where you're zooming in from. Uh, and you can also find some information about how to purchase tonight's featured books from Greenlight. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and you may be able to hear a car with really loud music going by my apartment, apologies. <laughs> We're excited to welcome you to our online event series, Squawk and Sports, hosted by Patrick Sauer and David J. Roth. For this installment, they'll be chatting with Dave Zirin about his new book, The Kaepernick Effect, and Craig Calcaterra about his new book, Rethinking Fandom. So you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Dave, Craig, Patrick, and David for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for coming out tonight. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the authors, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured books, The Kaepernick Effect and Rethinking Fandom are available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush App stores, where you can purchase Dave and Craig's books and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop those buy links in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the featured books. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Your series hosts for Squawk and Sports are Patrick Sauer and David J. Roth. Patrick has written for many large publications you've heard of and even more small ones that no longer exist. He's a founding member of the Billings, Montana to Brooklyn sports writing pipeline. David was an editor at Deadspin and is now a co-founder and co-owner at Defector.com. His writing has appeared in The New Republic, The New Yorker, Food and Wine, and The Baffler. Tonight, they'll be talking with featured authors, Dave Zirin and Craig Calcaterra. Dave Zirin is sports editor of The Nation magazine. He is the author of 11 books on the politics of sports, including most recently, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. He's also the host of the Edge of Sports podcast. Craig Calcaterra is the writer and editor of the daily baseball news and culture newsletter, Cup of Coffee. Previously, he was the lead national baseball writer for NBC Sports, where he launched and edited the baseball blog, Hardball Talk. Calcaterra's work has appeared on NPR, Bloomberg News, BBC, and ESPN. He lives in New Albany, Ohio. 
Craig is going to start us off with a reading from his book, Rethinking Fandom. And then he and Dave will be talking with Patrick and David and with all of you. Craig, please take us away. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm a bad reader, so we'll see how this goes. And then I haven't read my book for a long, long time. So again, we'll see how this goes. This is a, a middle chapter of my book and it is entitled Be a Fairweather Fan, which the title itself just pisses everybody off. So here we go. I'm about to say something that is going to shock almost every sports fan out there. It's okay to be a fair weather fan. It's okay to stop rooting for a team because they piss you off or because they stand for things you don't stand for. It's okay to stop rooting for a team because they lose too much. And it's okay to start rooting for another team because they win more. Or for that matter, to swap out your fan allegiances for any number of other reasons or no reason at all. That idea flies in the face of just about everything every sports fan has been taught their entire lives. We're taught that at the heart of fandom lies loyalty and that the definition of loyalty involves sticking with whatever or whomever one is loyal to through thick and thin. And generally, that's a pretty good policy in life, but why should it apply to sports? What has a professional sports team done for you to earn such loyalty? Where is it written that the team whose fandom you adopted when you were a kid or the fandom you were likely born into must stay the same forever? Nowhere that I can find. Which makes sense, because are you still eating the same foods, going to the same church, and voting for the same political party your parents did? Are you listening to the same music now that you listened to when you were 12? Of course not. Our tastes and our views on all manner of things evolve as we grow up and get on with life, so why not our sports affiliations as well? Can we not change them as we see fit? I believe we can. Indeed, I believe we should. In fact, in practice, I switch my sports allegiances a number of times. You can change who you root for even if you've never left your hometown and even if you didn't attend their rival. You can decide to root for another team for any reason or for no reason at all. Indeed, you can switch which team you root for simply because they suck. That's the one that caused sports fans to go crazy. They howl at me every time I say that one. But after all, isn't victory the sweeter when, you're, when you've endured defeat? If you abandon a team when they're at a low, do you not lose out on the ecstatic once in a lifetime feeling when they finally hoist that championship trophy? Don't you forego the opportunity to reminisce with fellow fans about what it was like to root for the team when it was at its lowest once they finally have reached the highest of the heights? To revel in shared tradition, shared history, shared suffering, shared misery, and then finally, at long last, shared celebration. Well, maybe, but such a thing's pretty overrated. It's overrated because the happiness that comes from victory is fleeting. It may even be a delusion. Psychologists refer to a phenomenon called durability bias which is one's belief that an event-driven feeling of happiness will bring lasting happiness, but such things rarely do. This even goes for big personal momentous things like getting a promotion and getting married. So it goes without saying that it applies to a sports team that you support when they win a championship. Perhaps the best example of this can be seen with the multimedia sports personality, Bill Simmons, who rose to fame lamenting his lot as a long-suffering Boston sports fan. When in 2004, the Red Sox finally won their first World Series in 86 years, Simmons wrote a book about the experience called Now I Can Die in Peace. Around the same time when the New England Patriots were just beginning their near 20 year run of dominance that saw them win six Super Bowls, Simmons wrote a still cited column for ESPN in which he set forth the so-called rules for being a true fan. One of which was the so-called five year rule, which Simmons defined thusly. After your team wins a championship, they immediately get a five-year grace period. You can't complain about anything that happens with your team for five years. There are no exceptions. For instance, the Patriots could finish 0-80 over the next five years, and I wouldn't say a peep. That's just the way it is. You win the Super Bowl, you go on cruise control for five years, and everything else is gravy. Well, everyone familiar with Simmons' work knows that the Red Sox winning the World Series in 2004 did not bestow peace upon his sports sensibilities, nor did he at any time go five years without complaining about them, or complaining about the Patriots, or the Celtics, or the Bruins after any of them won titles. He continues to complain and nitpick whenever, uh, whenever moves the Boston team makes and continues to be miserable by their losses and failures, big and small. Their triumphs, meanwhile, stick with him for an even shorter time now than they did 18 years ago. It's not because he's a hypocrite. It's because he was simply wrong about the level of satisfaction rooting for a championship team can bring. It's great in the moment, sure, but the feeling won't last. I think that is, uh, it's important to note that that was former writer Bill Simmons. I don't know what happened to that guy. Yeah, that was, that was a fun guy. He, now I, I, who listens to podcasts after all? He's a, he has a movie podcast now. He watches every week, he watches Rounders again. 
<laughs> what does he think? Does he have opinions on the Karate Kid? That's the one thing I want to do. Yeah, you have to go back in the, the archive for that one. Um, the delightful choice of chapter on your part, Craig, is one of my favorite little bits from the book. So. Yeah, as a uh, as a Sixers fan also, it really kind of hurts. It, you know, I felt that one. So you wouldn't know. We went from oh. <laughs> this team is just going to be objectively bad for five years, and I'm not getting younger. I mean, these, these aren't years I get back, to now sucking on this whole other level where – swapping in James Harden. Anyway, this is the first book. This is the second book. Both They're both very good. I know. I them from green lights. Dave, awesome. Craig, Craig, I have a follow-up question. Sure. And it's, it's more just a curiosity question because, you know, I, I, born, I was born and raised in New York City and I've lived the last couple of decades in D.C. raising kids out here. So my fandom has changed dramatically from New York teams to D.C. area teams, except my hatreds have remained the same. So while my loves have shifted, my, my, my anger is, is unabated from when I was a preteen. Like, and it's really being tested right now because I, I hate the Celtics with every fiber of my being. Another one. Oh my God. I see that Kelly Green and I'm 11 years old having my heart torn out by Larry Bird and there's no getting around that. Um, but it's so irrational, especially because I like the individual players on this Celtics team a lot. They're so good. They're <laughs> incredibly fun to watch. It's really frustrating. It is oh, like, so you, good. So David, I feel like you, you hear me on this one. Oh it's, my God, dude. Like I've been wrestling with like the Robert Williams, the third issue. Like that is <laughs> the most fun example of the most fun type of basketball player you can be. And he's just Everything about him rules, except for he's got the wrong damn uniform on. And it and is the really Celtic, hard. To, yeah. And the Celtics also being the coolest African-American team. This is the Boston Celtics. Where's Greg good. Kite? Where the yeah. hell is Greg Kite? <laughs> they I'm have older. Dan Daniel yeah, I'm Tice. older. I, I'm used to a very lily white Celtics team that was very easy to hate. So this is kind of hard too, yeah. yeah, yeah they do I have, in Daniel, in Daniel Tice, they have a guy that is like the most Boston looking dude that you could imagine. <laughs> he's from Germany. Like he's not like from Quincy or whatever, <clears throat> but he's got the, the vibe. Like he's like bringing the, yeah, Peyton Pritchard also. Like there's a real like <laughs> Linfield energy to them still. Like it's just, you have to wait for the uh, second unit for that to really take off. <laughs> Uh, one thing though, I thought was great in your book. And, um, when I picked it up, I thought it might be more of a, uh, sort of a rant against sports, you know, here's everything that's wrong, which there's some of that in there, but I think you accept on that. Most of us know the problems of ownership and, you know, we'll just start with that. Uh, but you make a good point that gets lost a lot in that sports are supposed to be fun on some level and being a sports yeah. fan is supposed to be fun. I, I don't get the misery. That's the thing. And I mean, we all we all know it. I mean, I can't get on Twitter. I don't really follow the NFL too much anymore. And I explain why in the book. But on Sunday, I see NFL tweets. And every single one is just pure bile and misery at everybody's own team. And <laughs> I maybe it's like, you know, selecting for that or something. But I don't get it. And I, as I also write in the book, I live in Columbus, Ohio. I went to Ohio State. Ohio State could go 12 and 1 and everybody will be miserable because of that one. And on one of the 12, if they didn't beat Akron by 50, but only beat Akron by 40, then everybody's pissed off for a week. Yeah. That's the level of fandom that I used to just sort of accept and be a part of, because I think all of us sort of think that that's part of it. But I just woke up a few years ago and said, I, I can't do this anymore. And the idea of the book, I mean, it's not rejecting fandom, it's rethinking fandom. And the, the needle that I'm trying to thread here is that there is still a part of sports, no matter what we think of it. And, you know, people like Dave and me spend a lot of time talking about all of the problems that surround, especially professional sports, but college sports as well, uh, about the ways in which it is unsatisfying and um, problematic. Uh, but there is still a core there that we love. There's a reason we became sports fans. It's the games, it's the players, it's the camaraderie, it's the, the feeling of civic pride. It's all those things come together. Can we have those? And can we find a way to deal with the externalities and the problems from professional sports. And I think we can, I don't know. I spent like 220 pages saying, I think we can, and I better hope. I <laughs> oh, do you because definitely, I, it's definitely <laughs> proven. If you need the answer, it's proven right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's small. It'll fit in the pocket of a light jacket. I have, this I'm is a manifesto, through. not a book. So, <laughs> but I think that there's something really to that point. Like, you know, if you're not going to gas yourself up for it, I will, I will do it. I think that like the back half of the book where you kind of address the questions 
that are raised by the problems that you write about in the first half of it, I think is really like, as somebody who, you know, also, I mean, I care about sports. I write about it for a living. Like, and I, so I can't unplug entirely from it. There is still this sense of trying to find a way to do it. That is not just like less insulting to what my own, like sort of beliefs and, you know, broader, like sort of ideology is, but also like there's that challenge of like trying to find a way to let it make you happy. And like, I think some of that is like, maybe that is, you know, middle-aged man chat here too. Like and that's obviously possible, but there's definitely a book that I wrote when I was like 47 and not a book I ever could have conceived of when I was 27. Yeah. And, I think just and, because you have yeah. less space in your life, you know? And so you want to like, if you're going to give this any space at all, like don't let it, you know, tear you up inside. Yeah, um, that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, j just, I, I, that's totally legit. What we write at 47 is not going to be what we write at 27. But isn't the world also so much nastier now than it was 20 years ago? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's not exactly a, a, you know, a contentious point. But, and then you think about who are the sports opinionists that define so much of the landscape. Like, I don't think Stephen A. Smith has enjoyed himself at a sporting event since the late 70s. I mean, he's so perpetually. I have respect for him in a certain way, in that you got to be wired a certain way to be able to do that and not just go completely insane. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that he is able to just live in that gutter of hating everything and get people like Skip Bayless and stuff and not just, you know, I don't know, do whatever drastic thing I would do if I was that person. Yes. Um, but it is a little different. Off to him. It is a little different now, though, that you can find. Um, you know, when we were growing up, there's basically like you had the papers and you had your columnists. I mean, I was in Billings, Montana, so we didn't, wasn't quite exactly the same, but, uh, and if they were cranks, you know, if you had Dick Young or whatever, he had all this influence. Those guys still exist. Obviously they've been amplified nationally. They're much worse. However, I've found at one point, another point I like in your book, you make it, it's exhausting to be a diehard fan. I have definitely gone that. I don't really even know every Met. Probably there's some pictures I'm unaware of. Um, I'd be happy to talk about I, that. that I know. Uh, off air if you want to do that. <laughs> but uh, but it's also easier to find like kind of a goofball sports world. You know, like yeah. as much as people hate Twitter, if you're following the goofy sports stuff, I find it almost easier now to just be about the fun in some ways, which I find much more pleasant than what. You were talking when you listen to sports talk radio because that's your only options kind in, of deal. In, yeah, in some ways it's hell, right? Because everything's nasty, everything's terrible, and then you know, and just there, there's no way to escape the the horrible existential angst of this world. But at the same time, there is enough escapism involved. There is, I mean, and on a basic level, fantasy sports. If you just want to do that, if you want to be on weird Twitter at 3 a.m. for rain delayed Giants games. Um, when someone is now trying to play the game of what the dude in the fifth row is wearing. That's fun, right? I mean, that's random and it's weird. Um, you can consume sports in a lot of different ways now, even in ways that are sort of adjacent to sports. Um, you don't have to either agree or disagree with the Dick Youngs of the world and listen to the Mike Francesas of the world uh, and just decide whose side are you on. You can, do, you can go a third or a fifth or a twelfth way. Yeah, and, that's one of the... And, and, oh, go ahead. No, that, that's I was going to say that the, the idea that you have at the end of the, the book, which is sort of maybe because it's, the, it's at the end, I thought of it as being like the final answer to the extent that you're in the final answer business. But that idea of like sort of meta fandom of like finding, maybe you should talk about what that idea is a little bit. I, I, I think made up that, there. Yeah, I made up the word meta fandom like 12 years ago. I wrote a column for Baseball Prospectus, like a guest column for them. Um, and... I was trying, I was against the deadline and I was trying to figure out what I was going to write about. And I had no idea. And I looked up, I have this poster that I got as a giveaway at Tiger Stadium in 1982 when I was nine years old. And it was uh, uh, Lipton T presents or, uh, you know, salutes the history of the World Series. And it, it was a poster of the front of every World Series program from 1903 through 1981. And I, I had that poster when I was a little kid and I was a baseball fan then, but of course I was a nine-year-old baseball fan and there are limits to what kind of fan you could be. And I had that on my wall and I actually found it again a few years later and I have it now. Um, and I learned and I sort of consumed baseball through these posters, through, through the, the covers of the, uh, of the programs. And when I think of the 1955 
World Series, I don't think of whatever happened in the 1955 World Series. I think of like this giant Walter Alston and Casey Stengel sitting outside this cartoon uh, Ebbets Field. Um, it's a way that I sort of relate to sports that has nothing to do with the sports themselves. It's through the poster. Or if you play a fantasy sport, you are dealing with sports through fantasy sports. Or if you play tabletop games, or if you just collect baseball cards, or if you're someone who is into baseball because you like the way butts look in tight pants, there are all these ways to sort of be in and around the world of sports and get personal enjoyment that you want that can be separate and apart completely from the game on the field. And I call that meta fandom because it's like kind of sports. That's legitimate too. You can check out completely. I know people who have checked out completely. Their team sucks. I, I you know, a friend of mine who is a Pirates fan, he has checked out of the Pirates completely, but he's really interested in like certain weird things about the Pirates. Um, and he's going to spend the, the whole year just not paying attention to the games, but paying attention to the, the like things. the Altoona curve. Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Great. I love and it. there's nothing wrong with that. You can check in, you can check out sports are there for us. They are entertainment. They are to enrich our lives. And I do think no matter how bad things get, no matter how bad people like me sit and bitch and complain every day. Um, I do think sports are a net positive in society. Um, well, it's, it's, I, I wanted to add, you, you have something in your book and this, you know, since we have the sports editor of the nation will fit right in when I, anybody who's tuned in probably pretty, uh, clear on where the politics of this uh, particular episode lies. Um, but you- you, <clears throat> I'm so a neo-reactionary. Both, uh, both wrote about the Tampa Bay Rays nonsense um, this week, uh, Dave and Craig. And it got me thinking about something you said in your book. And I, I think this is very often underappreciated, undermentioned, certainly under discussed in any mainstream, is that progressive values are also an added value in sports in a lot of ways. And it's almost never talked about in that sort of sense. And for me, it really hit home last year, uh, my daughter's 11 and we bought some, cause they were cheap, some really good seats to like four WNBA games. And I had, I'd paid modicum of attention to the WNBA prior to that. I, I knew the big names, that was about it. But the celebration within, I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, just lefty paradise in there it was so fun and we will keep going in part because of that sense of community and you know somebody in in your book uh dave one of the kids mentions how good it feels to protest how good it felt to protest and i was thinking that same thing from those black lives matter marches when we went on we took my daughter like it really does feel good and I, so i wanted instead to of us berating everything wrong with all of the right-wing aspects of sports which we all know and way too well ownership money blah 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 what you can get out of sports through through kind of that progressive lens which both of your books touch on um i mean that's the centerpiece of the kaepernick effect uh is how his gesture spread across the country high school college pro um but anyway i just as an idea as fans does that become part of your fandom does it make you more interested in certain players certain teams whatever um because it, it certainly does for me well, some, sometimes it's really problematic, like when Jalen Brown plays for the Celtics. Um, <laughs> Again with the Celtics. <laughs> well, is, is he in, is in so many respects the platonic ideal of what one would want in a politically conscious activist athlete. And then he throws on that Kelly Green and I'm like, yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I know it's terrible. heartbreaking. The worst it's, person, you know, <laughs> it's 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 ridiculous but that's one of the irrational parts of sports which is great to be my age and still be allowed to be irrational which yeah. is one of the fun parts of engaging with sports and you can kind of silo it in like this sort of like a safe sort of space like last year arguing with people in a dm about like how many mets were unvaccinated or whatever like that's not my <laughs> business i don't give a shit really like i mean i'd prefer it but yeah that's like it's a little places pillow to scream into but go ahead finish what you were saying i'm sorry Oh, just just and and just in, interrupt me if I'm going on too long. But it, it's so funny to me to think that, and this is part of what I was trying to explore with the Kaepernick effect, that people now actually look to the sports world and have for really the last ten years for some sort of progressive way forward, some sort of sense of resistance, some form of cultural reflection of broader anger in society, and that's so wild to me because you know certainly when I was growing up, sports wasn't that. But also at different times in history, sports has been like this forthrightly reactionary force. And I'm not even talking about leagues. I'm talking like, like how football players on campuses that were restive in the late 60s were often recruited to beat up protesters. I mean, that, there's, 
or, or at when they did the Columbia uh, University building occupations, the, the athletes formed a picket so food couldn't get in. I mean, that's what I associate so much. That's so much a part of like the human material of who's played sports. And now it's fascinating to me about how the shift in that regard. And so, so many people in these small towns and the Kaepernick effect, why they took a knee was because they felt like this is the public square of our community. I'm upset about police violence and this is where I'm going to be seen and this is where I'm going to be heard. There's something really interesting about your, I mean, this is a hundred percent me being an idiot. I assumed that it was going to be about Colin Kaepernick. Uh, it is a fascinating book and also a really just like a Herculean feat of journalism on your, how many people did you talk to for this? Uh, over a hundred. Yeah. I mean, and it is from, so I guess you could tell people what it is better than me, but it is like, it's not, it is about the effect. It is not about Kaepernick. And it is, I think, infinitely more interesting for, than that. Like just yeah. to see how this sort of ripples out through the culture. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's not about Colin Kaepernick. Um, Kaepernick effect. It's mainly looking at, I mean, and, and I got to say the, the media that um, was done at Deadspin and is done at The Defector was, was a real influence in <laughs> the book, not just <laughs> y'all, but other people across this, the new sort of sports journalism landscape that was writing about these individual protests in high schools of people taking a knee. Lindsey Gibbs is another person who wrote about like the phenomenon of people taking a knee. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, th th this actually is starting to have a national character. Uh, and that's really significant. And it's happening in small, this article over here is about a small town. This article over there is about Detroit. Uh, this is about upstate New York. This is about Southern California. Like, like this has national in scope. So I, I, when the pandemic started, I just said about like Googling people and finding them over social media and calling them up and doing long interviews about their experience, taking a knee. And then summer of 2020 happens, George Floyd protests, huge protests. And when I called back everybody, they were all organizing or in the streets. And it made me realize it was like this sort of eureka, holy crap moment where it's like many roads may have led this country to the summer of 2020, but one of them runs through the world of sports. Yeah, You have the line, and I, I'm not sure who said it, maybe it was Megan Rapino, but somebody said, courage is contagious. And I was wondering uh, when you were writing it, did you get momentum like one person led to another person? Like you start piecing together that this is because I I don't I think I, I knew that it had spread to a degree. I had forgotten how I guess how big it was or how uh and the timeline, I didn't realize this again how far before 2020 it was. But when you were writing it, did you start to feel the momentum and like you could kind of in your own journalistic work start to see the the building of it? Most definitely, because for a, a lot a lot of young people, it was, oh, I saw Kaepernick did that. That is a language of protest that I can replicate on my field. And that's, and that's to me, is Kaepernick's great gift to the struggle. I mean, he hasn't proven to be a, a mass leader or, or somebody who's out there commenting on every issue. That's just not who he's chosen to be. But what he did do was really bequeath a language to a generation of protesters that if you take a knee during the anthem, people are going to know where you stand on this all critical issue. And I, so I some it, of the, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Greg. I was going to say, I, find, I just find it fascinating. One of the like sort of hobby horses that I've been on for years and years with both politics, social stuff, sports stuff too, is how fragmented we are as a society now, how there are no common spaces and coming together spaces, but we still have sports. Mm -hmm. Sports is one of the only places where tens of thousands of people or millions of people on nationally televised things really agree on something at once or come together in one place. Something very powerful about that happening in sports where it might, it might, it used to be down at the public square, but we don't have public squares anymore. We have private, you know, mixed use malls. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I touched on that um, a little bit in the book, like the absence of community space, the atomization of society, the singularization and curating of individual experiences instead of or seeing something collectively and experiencing it collectively. I mean, you, you mentioned tens of thousands of people. I would just add on to that. Like if you're a small town and it's 500 people in the basketball gym, that's the town. And somebody takes a knee, all of a sudden the whole town is talking. And so especially if, you, if you're in a, a small town in, in, in you know, the middle of Florida and it's not like you can go down in, to the local Black Lives Matter protest, uh, you can affect your community by this one very simple act that you've been privileged to do 
because either you're an athlete or you're a cheerleader or you're in the band, you know, it, and that's, I think too, it's sort of connected to how we've deified youth sports. Like these young people feel like they have something to say. I mean, when I was 16, I did play sports. I didn't think I had anything to say right. whatsoever, <laughs> but you know, I think part of like the way we, we hold up these kids now playing sports is that some of them, it hasn't all gone to like having a big ego and whatever, but, but some, for some of them, it's like from the people I talk to, it's like a sense of community responsibility and leadership that probably shouldn't be on their shoulders in the first place. Yeah. That is a really interesting thread that sort of runs through the book, not just how seriously these kids and, and, you know, and kids, it's like high school kids, college kids, and then professional athletes too. So just people, we can say how seriously they take this, but then also that um, the way that it sort of cracks open these spaces that are, I mean, nothing to me, I think just because of the fact that as a culture, we keep going back to high school in America, that it is like <laughs> so much media is about it. So much of the dynamics of the way that like our discourse works is, is still fucking nerds and jocks and weird preppies and whatever, you know, like archetypes there are. But to see it sort of like, not just the idea of protest sort of breaking open a space there where like those containers are not quite as airtight as we're used to them being. Mm -hmm. But then also like these conversations happening in these spaces over and over again with these high school kids, that there's stuff in there about like, we're not going to do it unless everyone on the team is down with it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to like, you know, these colleges where, or high school where it's like, you know, not just the team does it, the cheer team does it, the coaches do it. Like that is organizing in its way. I mean, that it is politics. Yeah. And yet it is in a space that I think has been not just, as you said, I think mean, correctly said, like deified or held up and, and sort of like put on this sort of cultural pedestal, but that like the idea that that somehow existed outside of politics i think at this point is is by the boards like i think it was always bullshit but i think at this point you can look at it and just see that there is now room for that sort of conversation there and that conversation it's like and that air is being taken up now with that wonderfully subversive because um i think that was the one place that the establishment figured was safe um, yeah. Sports will always be sports. No one's. I mean, we, we better watch the hippie kids and the goth kids over here and see what they're going to do. Meanwhile, the athletes are the ones that are bringing the noise, and that's uh, really fun to see. Actually, yeah. I think that's but, to the point you both made about sports being a conservative or one of yeah, you that, used the word conservatizing, which I was like, that is actually a word, but I, I like I had not seen it before. That it is like that. I mean, that just basically that was the whole social utility of it, and I think that is well, probably league, why people I mean, get so mad about it now. Leagues are, by nature, you know, some are worse than others. Uh, athletes, depending on the sport, you know, goes down the middle, obviously, the NBA and the WNBA at the top, um, you know, baseball near the bottom. But fans and sort of high school and college players, there's no, re you know, athletes, athleticism is not a right wing or conservative thing to do just as a it's a thing you do because it's fun mm -hmm. uh and the, both of your books really show through that you know some of these high school kids in the Kaepernick effect especially the a, a cheerleader in a you know a female in a male space it's one thing when it's like a female playing and she's got her teammates but that the, some of the cheerleaders that was that is that is risky daring stuff and yeah. really impressive well I learned so much about the psychology of the cheerleader. I mean, I went to a Quaker high school. There weren't cheerleaders. Uh, <laughs> we're the, the fighting Quakers. It wasn't very intimidating. Um, <laughs> but you, you go to these these schools, the psychology of the cheerleader um, is very much like I am the face of my school. And so when they start getting politicized about what's happening um, in the world, they start thinking the face of this school is not a happy face. And I actually have a responsibility to show the world that when they come into this stadium. And oftentimes they were far more courageous than the football players. And that was a challenge with the book is, um, yeah, I didn't include all the interviews I did because I wanted it to be representative of what I felt like loosely the terrain was. And it was a lot of women. It was a lot of cheerleaders and it wasn't just football and that needed to be uh, put forward. Are the youths going to save us? Are they right when they say, oh my God, I have, a, I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old. I have no idea how in good hands we were.
Uh, I mean, some who, who said it? Steve Kerr, follow the kids. That's in the book, you know, like. Uh... <laughs> yeah, follow the kids is, is a big slogan. It's why I, when I finished the book, I actually was feeling kind of optimistic. I, I still can't believe that, but I was uh, <laughs> just having just like, cause it just like immersed in their lives. It's really not your thing. I've been reading you for years. <laughs> <It's>, and optimism <laughs> is just not a no. thing. So this might've been the best book you could have ever written. Yeah. And when I got off the phone, I'm skipping down the street, like, you know, singing change is going to come. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm a little off that these days, but I'm glad at least there's a testament to how I was feeling in one particular moment. Yeah, there is some real that it comes through, I think, not necessarily because you're shoehorning it in there. But this book has a very summer 2020 energy to it. And reading it in uh, summer 2022 is a very different feeling. I mean, it just feels like and yet there is, I think, something about it. I, you know, Craig asked the question funnier than I was going to do it, but that like. There is a sense in which even knowing at this point that so much of the energy of, well, that so much of the reactionary energy mustered against Kaepernick has not dissipated and that so much of the energy in 2020 has been co-opted or otherwise has been diffused. There's still the sense that of the people that you talk to in here, and again, like, you know, you're talking to the people that were brave enough to do a difficult thing. So that's maybe not representative of anything other than you know, the bravest cohort in that class, there is also the sense that this is an activation in some ways that like, once you do this and once you deal with the shit that they had to deal with, you know, where you're like, your team bus is being followed by weird mm -hmm. fans from like Beaumont, Texas that are like mad at you for having protested during a game. And it's like scary stuff that would not happen. It certainly doesn't happen to the average high schooler. Yeah. In talking I mean, to these kids, did you get the sense that they were, or how, I guess, were they changed, do you think, by this? Oh, well, the, the most of the people who I spoke with uh, in the high school section, it was, when I say most, I mean I, almost everyone as I'm thinking about it, uh, it was the first political thing they'd ever done in their lives. Uh, and they felt a certain comfort in doing so because it was an athletic space and their identity was so forged as an athlete. And it was almost like Kaepernick gave a sense of permission that this could be a space where they could project um, ideas of resistance. And what was remarkable was how transformative it was for them. Like, I'm not sure they were all the most courageous person in their in their class. I think the experience of going, because a lot of them didn't think it would be a big deal when they did it, or they thought they'd get, you know, a standing ovation, or they thought, well, you know, maybe Kaepernick's getting a hard time, but my community loves me because I score these goals or touchdowns. And then they got a very rude awakening. And it's really through the rude awakening. And this is honestly something that still gives me, uh, you know, it gives me some hope right now is like through that rude awakening, through that, that trial, by fire, uh, they, they ended up with no regrets. They ended up with more calluses and they ended up ready to go for the next round. And I don't think that's leaving sports ever. Uh, I think the wine is out of the bottle at this point and this is where we are. Well, I think it, the question I'm, cu I'm curious and you have to wait how many years if this is gonna reach any level of the um, executive ranks. I mean, ownership is another thing, but yeah, you made a great point the other day, Craig, that like, the Tampa Bay, uh, you know, Rays were, we're just having a discussion and we're, you know, we're taking all viewpoints when some uh, alleged uh, faith-based folks didn't want to have the gay pride um, rainbow on their hats. Or, um, but you said they would never do that with the military. And I think oh, that, yeah, that, yeah. That, is a fair, that is a fair point that where we talk about sports being conservative, the leagues, but I'm, I'm, it'll be fascinating if uh, militarism takes a hit that because that is one thing i've never seen in my lifetime I, I i'm at a bit of a disadvantage because i i primarily cover baseball and baseball is nowhere approaching this level of anything right baseball is still stuck in whatever decade you want to pick which is not now and uh but yeah i, I think the idea of uh selective activism is still really big the, the san diego padres every sunday home game wear camouflage uniforms uh big military town so they do that and then of course on various patriotic holidays they all the teams wear flags and things like that uh you mentioned you know anybody from your quaker school dave who was <laughs> against uh the military would not 
uh, dare if they were a major league baseball player, not wear the, the red, white, and blue on, you know, veterans day or whatever. Um, it's very selective. And I, I have hope because I, I read your book and I see the things, what the kids are doing. Um, and then I wonder how does that bubble up? And I just see this, this wall of commerce and wall of conservatism, maybe because I'm paying attention to baseball. And I just feel like somewhere in between the high school level and, and once it gets up there, that it's just going to get beaten out of people. I, I hope that's not the case, but I feel like it's the case. Actually, I think I wanted to talk about this. Chelsea, can you uh, play the clip? Because I actually am curious to hear your thoughts on this uh, via sports and being co-opted and big business, how this all ties together because uh, this I thought was... I never know what the clip is before Patrick plays it, but I think uh, I might know what this one is. It's Paul Rudd doing the aliens. Yeah, <laughs> every time. <laughs> Come on. He got him again recently, didn't he? Dude? Yes, on this podcast, he got him with it. That was very good. So this is picked up in the middle. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. When they talk about the greatest team in the history of the sport, make sure it's your team. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football, play it at the highest level. And if you're a girl from Compton, don't just become a tennis player, become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. But let's go on the, um, you know, this is not about Kaepernick. He, you know, obviously got robbed of a ton of money out of his career. And, uh, you know, we'll put, we'll say it's all in good faith on that end. But there is something different about how every, somewhat progressive movement gets co-opted by brands to where you end up with Jerry fucking Jones kneeling on the Dallas star, you know? Uh, I mean, we have a, we have a Muhammad Ali expert here and Muhammad Ali was the enemy. And I'm just wonder if you guys think, um, does it matter that Nike gets involved? I mean, does it change things? Are they watered down or is it just, this is the way of the modern world. The brands are always going to do what they do. I don't know. My, I get mad, obviously, when I see things like that. Your, your first, I'm, look, I'm a Gen Xer, so anything that is compromised <laughs> and anything yeah. that is co-opted is terrible to me. And how dare they sell out? But it's an unofficial um, ad busters uh, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> exactly. Um, Reality bites. <laughs> God, I'm so old. Um, no, the, I, I, I want to bristle at that. And there are a lot of reasons to be cynical about that. And there are obviously a lot of incentives that people like Nike or every corporation with a pride flag or, or whatever um, has going on. I want to believe, and this might be a naive belief, that there's some that gets through. There's something that gets through, that there's a, tr maybe not trickle down is probably the wrong word here, but that even in a watered down co-opted fashion, that attitude comes through and affects younger people and pushes the envelope a little bit farther about what's available to them. Uh, you know, I, in the eighties, there was this sort of like retro sixties thing that happened for a while when I was in high school and it was so artificial and polyester and weird and everything. Uh, but some of it got through, right? You, how did you get friends that were sort of weird hippie types that, that thought, you know, that the Gulf war was wrong. The first one that everybody loved. Um, if it wasn't for somehow some kind of hangover effect of getting it on a third wave through or a, or a fourth wave through, there's probably net good there, even if it's a cynical impulse. That's I. That's my hope. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. A um, couple of things. I mean, of course, it affected people when Colin did that ad. I mean, people who saw him as a hero who've also spent their lives working against Nike. I mean, I heard from so many people who'd done sweatshop work over the year, labor rights over the year, over the years, and they were like, how could Colin do this? You know, and my response is very much, 
good faith. You know, the NFL robbed him of, of millions and millions of dollars. I don't begrudge a second that, you know, he's doing what he would, you know, what he does to make a living. You know, that's the, the NFL created these circumstances, not Nike. But the, the flip side of that, though, that, that I just feel like on principle, I got to say, like, like the, the, the message of the ad, which is basically anyone who tries hard enough can make it or anybody who dreams big enough can make it, really runs counter to what I heard him say at like the Know Your Rights camp in Chicago, where <laughs> he, his message to the kids was much more, much more grounded. And much more like we live in a society that has systemic racism into it. What we hope to do at this camp today is talk to you about how to navigate that society so you can come out the other end. Like very much like, you know, that this world is, is, is fucked up and here's a method for dealing with it. And, you know, that's not what that ad is. Yeah, it's a very no. try hard, be the best. You're going to totally own this crap. And that's yeah. the part of it that I remember being like, it's funny watching it again. Like I, my reaction to it is so viscerally negative, even though I think that like all of the people that they're singling out as being like, here's somebody that you should aspire to be are some of the athletes that I admire the most. The, I mean, they're the athletes that everybody admires the most, including Kaepernick, I think in a lot of ways, but that there is that, the idea, I think that I wrote something about this at the old site too, that it was basically like, what's offensive about it is not that it's hacky, it's the idea of trying to appropriate striving and dreams by a brand that like Nike being like compete, you know, be the best, do your best, whatever, like, and, you know, be active, all that shit. Like, sure, whatever. I mean, they're a brand. I don't care what they say. Like, it's not going to impact how I move through the world. But the idea of like taking the, these very important concepts stripping the context from them utterly and then packaging to you only the aspiration of it as being something that like, you know, just a way for you to be better at whatever your job is or whatever your, you know, sort of particular like fixation is. To me is like, that's, it's a very crystalline expression of like, I think what Patrick is asking about, which is basically like, what does it mean to see something as important as this and as human as this get appropriated into something that like fundamentally is not human like not just systemically but then like these brands these teams organizations whatever where like they're they exist to extract not to exalt mm -hmm. the human or whatever and it's, it's a lot i think it's just a lot easier to co-op i mean we're all gen x you know on the other side i'm on the other side of 50 now there's no i don't there's these my daughter and I'm sure your kids, Craig, there's no, they've never lived at a time when the big business was the bad guy because it's too big. It's too ingrained. And, you know, especially in the, and this isn't social media rant, but in the phone world, there's no, uh, there's no us and them. So I'm not even entirely sure that that would make any sense to some. Um, I think, I don't think this, I think that ad is particularly weak for the reason you mentioned, but there are other Nike ads have been very good. And it's still Nike who has, you know, sweatshop and et cetera. Um, I want to tie this in with one of thing that I, I'm going to be brief because this is something that I've been thinking about recently and kind of fixating on. And I think in part because I was reading these books back to back um, as quickly as I could because I'm still not good at getting things done on time in my life. But there is this idea, I think, of, you know, Craig sort of, talks about it as a in a fan perspective and i think it's it runs through dave's book in terms of like learning how to make the best of a world that is not changing at the pace or in the ways that you want it to change and i think there's a sort of humanity that runs through both that again like doesn't require the sort of like ultimate victory that is the stuff of Nike ads or of that particular Nike ad that it is basically like, you know, in Craig's book. And I think to a certain extent in Dave's book, it's it, with Craig, it's an insistence on being grown and smart about what you consume and making choices with that in mind. And then in Dave's, it's just this insistence on being seen and being human. Yeah. One but of I the first, I'll say one of the first like book events I did a couple of months ago after the book came out, um, I got like sort of pumped up in whatever this, it was like a video cast kind of thing of, uh, this is the guy who's going to tell you how to, how we're going to fight back 
and how we're going to take sports back for that. And I'm sitting there listening to this intro. I'm like, did they read the book? Yeah, like, obviously, you're not familiar with my work. (laughs) I'm like, I'm not saying that at all. This is about, we've all seen that, like, old Western or sci-fi movie or whatever, where there's somebody who says, the war is over. We lost. And and you got to deal with it. Like, that's like like a trope. That's where we are in sports, right? I mean, I, I don't think for a minute we are going to change what I very pretentiously call the sports industrial complex in my book, um, but we can find a place in it where we can be comfortable and where we could be okay with where we are. I'm not the biggest pessimist on the planet, but I'm a pretty big pessimist these days. And I think right now that's the best we can do with almost anything is we need to find a place where we can find a little bit of shelter for a while until the ship blows over and hopefully be comfortable in that time. I think that we can do that in sports too. That sounds way worse than the book comes off as, but it's kind of, it's kind of where I'm at with this. We're not well, changing anything. We're not, you know, casting blows against the empire, but we can certainly make some peace with it in certain places. It makes it. I, mean, I think you you make a good case that if you take on sports, uh, you know, if it's progressive particularly, and you take on sports as a political thing, you're gonna lose. Uh, you know, it, it, you just can't win. So find some joy in it because you're right. There's every day. There's less joy. And there are more important things in sports. I hate to say that as a sports writer, but there are. And like, if I'm going to make, you know, use my energy, I I hope that it's going to be to like affect change for a lot of people and not just to make, you know, a bunch of sort of like rich suburban baseball fans. Mm. But if you're not going to change leagues and, and brands or whatever, I think this is the other thing in Dave's book that like that, the work of like insisting on your own dignity and stuff, like it seems like it changed these people's lives. It changed the lives of the people that were around them. It changed, you know, that community. So again, it doesn't, it doesn't percolate at the speed that you might want, but I think there is still some space there for that type of, of resistance. I mean, there, there's something humbling to me and, and, imp- and impressive and also sad <laughs> at the same time that the people I spoke with, another invariable common thread between them is that their sights were very, very modest. It's like, why are you doing this? It wasn't because I'm going to end racism or because we're going to reclaim the sports world and remake it on a more just scale. We're going to decolonize the sports world. There was none of that kind of rhetoric. It was like, I want to start a conversation. I want to be seen. I want you to feel, as one person said, as uncomfortable for three minutes as I feel every day in this school. I want to make you feel the discomfort that I feel. You know, these kinds of very low, low sights for what they want to achieve, but it's still inspiring to me because if that's the space we have to operate in, then that's the space we need, we need to get in where we fit in. And if they, if they are able to do that, then I think it does give an example about how we need to look in small ways around us to push against the tide that's coming. Well, I, I, this, is, this is the perfect segue because we have a squawk in sports first and it's gonna come for question to you, Dave. So uh, thinking about joy in the future and trusting the kids, I was away in New Orleans when the book arrived with my wife and my daughter liked the cover and she read it. And I told her if she finished it, which she's getting there, she's close. She's in the pro section. She could ask a question. So this is Molly, uh, come on. Hell yeah, good idea. She has a question for you, a football related question. What's up Molly? Can you see her? Hi. Hey. I, I can't see myself. Um, you have a few years oh, yeah. Okay. So um for you for the like football thing, um, do you think like what do you think the reason for Kaepernick not making the team? And do you think it was kind of do you think football related, did he deserve to be on the team for a skill wise? That that's a great question. And uh if you want to go on Twitter, you can get a lot of different answers. <laughs> Do not don't tell us. He does not want to go on Twitter. Twitter. I, he's anti-social media for me, so. Listen to your dad. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm from the future. Keep them off social media, <laughs> please. But in in my humble opinion, and there there are opinions about this. Uh, absolutely, he is a top half quarterback in the National Football League. His last season, he played. 12 games through 16 touchdowns, four interceptions. His team was terrible. His receivers led the league in drops. Uh, So I got to tell you, like, oh, and he led the entire NFL in yards per carry, which a lot of people don't realize that last year. So it's all to say 
that he absolutely deserves to have a job and they're not giving him a job uh, because of what he believes in his mind. And that's not right. Does it, well, let me follow up on that. Does it surprise any of you that no team, because I had actually forgotten he had a good season. I, I was thinking that he had kind of peaked Super Bowl and he had become at least middling enough that they could, um, you know, blackball him in good conscience. But it, does it surprise you that no team would take that step? I mean, or is that is owner, or is that just NFL ownership? Because man, winning cures all on some level, doesn't oh, it? I, I don't know. I think the word went out. I think it was. There oh, were you think it was of... totally orchestrated, like oh, a yeah. whole. Oh, I, I'm convinced it was. I think that's where he got his settlement from. I think that's it, to, to the extent that we can know this. I think it certainly was that. Yeah. He's didn't he like work out with the Raiders or something he, last recently? Week? Yeah, yeah, recently he's done that a couple of times, I think. And I think it's, I don't know what the incentive or what the what the motive. It was is. weird that Little Lord Fauntleroy, uh, <laughs> E.F. Chang brought brought him in to work out like. Usually they've just kind of talked about it and sort of hinted around. It was strange that they brought him in and had a whole. It felt. I don't, I don't know who would benefit from it. I think it the, the, organizationally, I think they were trying to like remove the stain of the Gruden racism from earlier this offseason. Oh, I forgot. It was that. kind of cynical, although it's also the sort of thing where like cynical, though it may be. And even though he hasn't played in, you know, five, six years now that like he's for sure better than Nathan Peterman. That like this yeah. is the other team that had. <laughs> I think worked him out at all was the Seahawks and their excuse for it from Pete Carroll was that he's too good to be a backup. Mm. Like we think he's a starter in this league, which is like, so therefore we're not going to keep him on the roster, which is one of those things. It's not the, the weirdest like belief that Pete Carroll has, but it's fallacies. up there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could, I think you can make the argument though. Um, I don't, <clears throat> not playing those five years, uh, taking those hits to the head. I mean, Kaepernick's legacy is it's richer than I knew, thanks to your book, Dave. Uh, he, and he got the Nike money in the settlement. I mean, he kind of came out ahead, even though I know he would probably not look at it that way if he's still trying to make the league. But I don't know. Didn't he win ultimately on some level? He's wired differently, though. I mean, as all these quarterbacks are. I mean, as much. I mean, it's it's so interesting, too. Like, if this was fiction, like what this would look like. Here's Colin Kaepernick. He's basically been granted the world. He's going to be an icon for decades, no matter what he does. Uh, there are a million organizations that would pay him to speak at a moment's notice. He's got a documentary coming out done by Spike Lee. And all he really wants to do is play football, even though the worst possible last act would be if he got out there and couldn't play yep. and the whole right wing had a big guffaw. He still wants out there. I mean, just wired. Differently yeah. the Athletes, man, are, are just built different. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of admirable it. and it's kind of ridiculous, but it yeah. is, yeah, for sure worth noting. That is a, we, a good We point. are all types that would say, oh, you know what the best job ever would be to be a bullpen catcher. That would yeah. be so amazing. That's not how real <laughs> athletes operate. No. Like, no uh, I would back up Derek Carr if it just meant like standing around and getting paid like one and a half million dollars periodically <laughs> high-fiving someone as they come off the field. What's uh, what's the guy from Missouri uh, who's made like Chase Daniel, minutes? Chase Daniel, Six, legend, sent a millionaire, um, Chase Daniel. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> let me uh, let me ask one. We'll wrap up here, but one quick question, uh, one answer from each of you. Give us something that uh, from you know the progressive lens of sports. What what are you feeling good about? And I will say, uh, for me, mentioned earlier, I think the WNBA is finally on its own, at least somewhat solid footing. I think it is no longer uh some nba toy that certain announcers mentioned earlier on uh were shoved in his face and i'm not going to take this anymore um i feel like the wnba has got its spot now and well, women's team sports in general seem to be carving their own actual niche as opposed to um you know being just complete also rans so that's mine I, I agree with that. I, I will say this, and it's going to sound chaotic, and it's going to be really ugly before it gets better, but I think the uh, name, image, and likeness stuff in college sports is the the camel's nose under the tent that's going to completely screw up college sports in a way that college sports <laughs> need to be screwed up. I live in Columbus, Ohio. This is Ohio Hello. State land. Guys are now like, it, when they're advertising, okay, he's got a Bentley, so he's going to come here. We are now going to see the end game of college sports as we've known it for our whole entire lives. And I'm totally fine with that. Wait, look, the Saudis are going to come over and do a complete college sports competition <laughs> league. 
and uh, screw I up to, the NCAA. I have um, to throw in a line there. Uh, Justin Lewis, a uh, Marquette guy who declared for the draft last year, uh, represented a downtown Milwaukee bar. But the joke was he had an Instagram picture where he raved about the duck nachos. So he became hashtag duck nachos every time he scored. It was a, it was a, lot, it was a lot of fun. You got to be careful out there when uh, you get into commerce, man. <laughs> Dave? I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited about the fact that uh, my, my kid who's going into ninth grade is actually going to be playing JV football. And I was freaking out about that for reasons, both injury related and toxic masculinity related. And I have found that the team and the coach are specifically trying to uh, exercise an atmosphere that tries to bring out the best in people. And it's a reminder to me that it is possible for sports to be used in such a way. It doesn't, you know, it's like the old, cliche it's like fire it can burn down your house or it can cook a meal and it's nice to be having that meal being cooked uh here in my house now uh it doesn't solve the injury problem but uh at least from the toxic masculinity problem it makes yeah. me feel good that sports can actually act counter to that and not be a handmaiden to more toxic masculinity Ralph, i was gonna say like i i was having kind of a hard time coming up with an answer but i feel like that there's something in Dave's to build on uh, there that just the idea that I do think that to the extent that, uh, you know, you look out across the scene now, there's, it's a little bit difficult for me to find a whole lot to hang your hat on. Like there's individual players here and there. I think that the, like the broader scope of how these things are talked about and thought about is a little bit different. I think the, uh, the thing that I want to believe and that I think, I can believe more having read Dave's book and then also from his experience with that is that like the good stuff isn't here yet that, but that it is coming that like, this is basically this struggle that is now like sort of devouring our entire culture and politics to keep things exactly as they are forever. That is a losing battle. And that just because that's how the numbers work. And because like at some point, you know, old people die, <laughs> but there is <laughs> this, I, I think that there, it's not perfect and you don't want to wait for the kids to save anybody because we've all got work to do ourselves, but that I think that the world that's coming is going to be more humane than this one because anybody that was forced to grow up in the wreckage that these generations made uh, would not wish to live there if they could be anywhere else. So that's nice. That and is nice. Uh, we, we won't mention climate change. Yeah. Uh, follow the kids, as Steve <laughs> Kerr said. Uh, real quick, July 12th is our next show. Uh, I think we're probably, that'll be the last one for the summer. We have the great Howard Bryant. Uh, two legends. Who has a, a new biography of maybe the most entertaining baseball player who ever lived, um, Ricky Henderson. And it's a whole mm. book. It is growing up in Such Oakland. Uh, have, you, have you read it? I just got oh, one. Yeah. Such a good book. Interviewed Howard today for the radio show I do in DC, such a good interview. I'm gonna tune in in July, it's gonna be a blast. Uh, yeah, he's a great, I can't think of a better writer subject than that. Yeah, we were, that was a layup for us. I'm <laughs> excited to have him on, so. Um, and uh, so until then, once again, Rethinking Fandom, Kaepernick Effect. I have one too. Buy them from Greenlight or your favorite indie. Uh, happy Pride, happy 4th of July. Uh, Pete Alonzo's injury wasn't bad. So, uh, yeah, terrific. Right. I was going to say, like, happy Starling Marte problem. <laughs> um, tomorrow. And uh, be sure to read uh, if you have not, if you don't read The Nation, you should. And a cup of coffee is an excellent way to get your scores in the morning. I no longer have to open any apps or read any boring AP stuff. Yeah, Craig. I don't really give you real information, I just make jokes. The books <laughs> both are really good, guys. Thank you for taking the time to do it. Appreciate it. Take us out, Chelsea. Good. Yeah, thank y'all all so much for a wonderful conversation tonight. Um, you can buy The Kaepernick Effect and Rethinking Fandom from Greenlight in store if you're local here to Brooklyn or on greenlightbookstore.com for shipping anywhere in the U.S. or local pickup. Um, and like uh, Patrick said, um, we've got another Squawk and Sports coming up in July. Um, our July events will be up on our calendar early next week, also on greenlightbookstore.com. So keep an eye out there for that Zoom registration link. Uh, thank y'all all so much and have a great rest of your night. Bye. Bye. Peace.